All right, mil gracias, mil gracias. Nancy, I know you're no stranger to the uh, the chamber here, but I wanna start this everyone. And uh, to say that I'm excited to make this next introduction, I, I have to share, it, it will truly be an understatement because ever since listening to it and meeting Dr. David Hayes Batista close to four years ago and having the ability to have listened to him on a number of other occasions, it's always been my intention to do everything that I could to bring him here to Charlotte, to my fellow community leaders and, and listen to his remarkable data and message and, and, and also being a true pioneer in changing the narratives around the Latino community here, here in the US. Now, I'm gonna do my best here to, to share a little background on Dr. Hayes Batista, as you can imagine, uh, a lot of uh, certifications there, but Dr. David Hayes Batista um, is currently a distinguished professor of medicine and director of the Center for, for Study of Latina Health and Culture at the David Jeffen School of Medicine at UCLA. He graduated from UC Berkeley and uh, completed his doctorate work in, in, in basic science at the University of California Medical Center in San Francisco. Dr. Hayes Batista served on the uh, served on the faculty at the School of Public Health at UC Berkeley until 1987, when he took his current position there at, uh, at UCLA. Uh, so for, for decades, Dr. David Hayes Batista has, has prepared minority medical researchers to use their, their lived experiences of the Latino double imposter syndrome as the basis for leadership in, in, in the research laboratory to create better sciences to provide care to California's multicultural, multiracial patient population. And for the past five years, he's been chosen um, as one of the 101 top leaders of the Latino communities in the US by, by the Latino Leaders Magazine. And in addition to lecturing in a number of leadership programs, ranging from Chicano Latino Youth Leadership Programs to the Denver Latino Leadership Institute. He's, uh, he, he served as a faculty director for the AGSM Latino Leadership Institute in 2003. And uh, Dr. Hayes Batista, in his, in his time off, he, he writes columns for uh, the Los Angeles Times and LA Opinion, and, uh, and is often asked to provide opinions on radio and television in both Spanish and English. Um, he, he recently wrote a book detailing the history of Latino leadership in, health, in the healthcare sector, uh, The Chicano Boom, Healing California from 1965, 1985. Uh, but prior to bringing Dr. Hayes Batista up, I believe all of the speakers so far has mentioned how we all wish we could have done this in person, as I'm sure everyone would agree, how, how nice it would be to to see everyone, shake some hand, hug some people, um, share some hors d'oeuvres and a glass of wine together. Um, but so I'm gonna say in the spirit of the good old days, although I know it's not the same, I gotta confess that I put my suit on, got my pocket squared on, I prepared a plate of hors d'oeuvres, I got a glass of wine here uh, for, for, for us to share. Um, and, and, and I encourage you to do the same, sit back, get comfortable, because I promise you that for the next hour, you're truly in for a treat. So Dr. Hayes Batista, over to you. Thank you so much, Jose. And oh, let's see, somebody's got to stop sharing screen so I can share mine. There we go. All right, so I'd like to uh, take the um, GDP material and let's make it really specific because what I wanna share with you tonight is our research on the US Latino GDP, that is Latinos in the United States. And this is the report. Uh, you can uh, access it if you wish, or I can send you the link, the 2020 Latino Donor Collaborative US Latino GDP Report. So we're looking at the 60 million Latinos in the United States. And one of the things we wanted to do is make sure people understood just how valuable Latinos are. And what we decided to do was to actually calculate the GDP. That's the metric most people understand as uh, in terms of, is this a, an economically good situation to get into or is it not? Just simply, it's the total monetary value of all finished goods and services produced by a geography within a given year. And our geography are the 60 million Latinos living within the United States. So to make a long story short, for the year 2018, the 60 million Latinos in the US produced the world's eighth largest GDP. We're following behind only the United States, China, Japan, Germany, UK, France, India, and then Latinos de Estados Unidos. We are a big dog economy. We're not number 20, we're not number 30, we're not number 80, we are number eight. And as you look at the growth rate, because you know, uh, investors, when they are going into an area want to know two things. First of all, what's the size of a GDP? And bigger is usually better than smaller. 
and you want to look at growth rate. And as you know, negative growth rate is horrible. Flat, zero growth rate is horrible. Slow growth is horrible. What you like is a nice sustainable growth rate. Well, for the year 2017 to 2018, the Latino growth rate, GDP growth rate was eight and a half percent. Eight and a half percent. In fact, that was nearly three times higher than the US growth rate and the fastest of the top 10 GDPs. So we're a big dog and we are running very, very fast. But that was just one year. Uh, and I think it was a little bit unusual, but as we look over the longer period of time, 2010 to 2018, the compound annual growth rate for the Latino GDP was the number three of the top 10 at a little over 3%, again, about 50% higher than the US total, which is a little over 2%. But the more important question is, what type of folks would actually create the world's eighth largest economy? Well, to hear some people have talked about it, the 60 million Latinos are just a bunch of bad hombres and malas mujeres. How could they possibly create the world's eighth largest GDP? Maybe, just maybe, that world's eighth largest GDP was created by good Americans who happen to be Latinos. Well, in fact, how do you create the world's eighth largest GDP. And I'd like to just put some data up against common misperceptions of Latinos. One is you need to have a population with a very high work ethic. So in fact, as we look at labor force participation, which is a key metric here from 2005 to 2018 uh, annually, the column is the Latino labor force participation rate and the blue line is everybody else. So you notice even back in 2005, it was clear that Latinos had a higher percent participating in the labor force than non-Latinos. It's about 66 and some odd percent versus about 65 some odd for non-Latinos. Then we got to the last, oops, last recession, went down, uh, then bumped back up. And then throughout the early teens, in fact, we started to see something. The non-Latino labor force participation rate has steadily gone down and down and down and down. Whereas the Latino was not only was steadier at much higher, but in fact has been slowly increasing since 2015, so that we're getting a labor force premium when you have Latinos in your labor force participation rate. In fact, close to um, close to six percentage points higher. That's what you get for having Latinos in the labor force. What does a strong work ethic translate to? Well, this isn't just a recent thing. I happen to have. 75 years worth of data for California from 1940 to 2015. And in those 75 years, Latinos here in the orange circles consistently have had a higher rate of labor force participation than non-Hispanic white. In fact, higher than any other group for 75 years. That's three generations of workers. I think you could say working hard is kind of a Latino thing. Latinos tend to work more hours per week compared to non-Latino workers. And Latinos work more in the private sector compared to other workers and work less in the public sector. This is why it's hard to find a Spanish speaking uh, clerk in the post office or in the motor vehicle. Latinos just rarely work in the public sector. On top of that, besides a very vigorous work ethic, you wanna have a group that's very family oriented. Well, Latinos do that. Uh, we do it quite well. In fact, as we look at our the rate at which households are established. Again, the columns from 2011 to 2018 is the percent uh, growth rate of Latino households. And that's been at around about two and a half percent over that period. The blue line is everybody else non-Latino, which is anemic at about a half a percent. Basically Latinos are establishing host households at about six times the rate of non-Latino. And of course, we tend to have uh, really dense households. We tend to have a lot of generations, a lot of those three generation households. Then you want a population that is self-sufficient. I know there's a lot of stereotypes about Latinos and welfare and everything, but quite frankly, that is not sustained by the data. Here we have for California, three data points. In 1990, before welfare reform, Latinos were far less likely than non-Hispanic whites to use welfare were less likely after welfare reform, a long time after welfare reform, still less likely. Actually, Latinos use public programs the least of any population. 
You want a population that is business friendly. Well, Latinos do that. As we look at the growth group of Latino owned businesses, they have been skyrocketing since the 1990s. And everywhere I travel around the country, I just see oodles and oodles of Latino owned businesses opening up. You'd also want a population that is healthy. And it turns out that is Latino. If we look at the top four causes of death in the United States for, uh, this is 2017, number one, number one cause of death is heart disease. Well, the non-Hispanic white death rate age of just is, uh, is 168.7. That's deaths per 100,000. Whereas the Latino rate is 30% lower. Latinos have 30% fewer heart attacks. Likewise with cancers, the non-Hispanic white rate is 160.8. The Latino is 110. Latinos have 30% fewer cancers. We have 40% fewer unintentional injuries, 60% fewer chronic lower respiratory diseases. And so it goes on and on for almost everything with only one exception, which is diabetes, but that's a rare cause of death. It's not within the top five, top four here. So I guess it must be all that good food and all that movement. Zumbas, I don't know. Uh, and also, this could also be due to the fact that Again, stereotypes to the contrary. Latinos are far less likely than non-Hispanic whites to smoke and far less likely to use alcohol. So the summary measure of all of this is life expectancy at birth. At 81.8 years, Latinos have a nearly three year longer life expectancy than non-Hispanic white. So these are the, the elements of a population that would produce the world's sixth largest uh, economy a very strong work ethic, family-oriented, very self-sufficient and independent, business-friendly, healthy, and by the way, very patriotic. Uh, Latinos have always stepped up to fight this country wars from World War II to the current uh, engagement in Afghanistan. We are truly the type of population capable of producing the world's eighth largest economy. We are not a bunch of bad hombres and malas mujeres. Bad hombres and malos mujeres would not be creating the world's eighth largest economy. We are very, very good Americans, but we just happen to be Latino. So what I'd like to do is have you go into your breakout rooms and just discuss among yourselves, gee, what was the most interesting thing you just learned about the Latino gross domestic product? And I'll stop screen sharing so we can go out into our breakout rooms. Then we'll come back and share what we discuss. Okay, so uh, do we have any time for large group discussion? I guess not. Okay, so let me get into my next piece here. Share my screen. Hold on a second. I did this wrong. You'd think I have learned how to do this after all these years. There we go. All right, so I want to move to a related topic because we were talking about patriotism. So I want to chat a little bit about the Cinco de Mayo. Now, Cinco de Mayo is probably the best known quote unquote Mexican event, Latino event in the US. Uh, every year it's celebrated in hundreds of venues. But if you ever go to Mexico, Nobody celebrates Cinco de Mayo in Mexico. So for me growing up, the question was, well, why do we celebrate it so much here in the US when it's not celebrated in Mexico? And I finally discovered the answer and I can tell you in 30 seconds. Um, and it's simply this, El Cinco de Mayo is not a Mexican holiday. Try it out, go to Mexico on a Cinco de Mayo. And unless you're in a tourist zone, nobody celebrates it. So what is Cinco de Mayo? It is an American Civil War holiday created by Latinos here in the United States during the American Civil War. I know, I know people are saying, wait a minute, Latinos in the American Civil War? Why, you weren't even here. Didn't y'all just get here 20, 30 years ago? No, we were here. We were in the Civil War. In fact, in many ways, we helped to tip the country 
into what was happening. And it is an illustration of Latino, Latino leadership, which has been present in this country for nearly 300 years. In this case, we're gonna look at the case of the American Civil War. It has to do with here leadership on September 16th, when Father Hidalgo declared Mexico's independence from Spain, that's on September 16th, 1810. And in his declaration of independence, he, de he also explained why was Mexico seeking independence from Spain? One of the first things he said was that once Mexico achieved its independence from Spain, he was going to abolish slavery. He said, how can we be a modern democracy, a modern republic and hold other human beings in bondage? So he was not only going to free the slaves, he was giving the slave owners 10 days to free the slaves or he was going to put the owners in jail. There was none of this two, two step and stuff about personal property or whatever else. Secondly, he declared racial equality and civil rights. And in fact, just two months after uh, his declaration of independence, his Lieutenant Jose Maria Morelos announced the establishment of this new government of Mexico, the Republic of Mexico that will not label anyone as Indian, mulatto, nor any racial group. Rather, all will be known in general as Americanos. Somos Americanos, people tend to forget that. We are Americans, have been. This wasn't part of the Declaration of Independence, but it was an old Iberian legal tradition that was continued on it, uh, into the Mexican Republic, which is that married women could own property independently of the husband. And this was not unique to Mexico. In fact, every single Latin American country upon achieving independence from Spain also abolished slavery, declared racial equality and citizenship and de decreed that married women had rights. This is important because the Southwest, you see, from Texas over to California was part of Mexico. So you had a generation of folks growing up here in the United States, what was going to become the United States, uh, just thinking, well, it's normal. Of course, we got rid of slavery. Of course, all races are equal. Of course, women have rights. That's just normal, isn't it? But then occurred what I call, and this is my term, the Latino Big Bang. 10 days that shook the Spanish-speaking world in California, in the United States, and actually in the Western Hemisphere. What happened in those 10 days? Why do I call it the Big Bang? Well, the Big Bang started on January 24th, 1848, with the discovery of gold. And we've all heard about the California gold rush. What we don't hear about is that Latinos were involved in the gold rush big time. They knew about gold. Here is a, an engraving in a Spanish language paper um, from 1851, telling people, guess what? They discovered gold in California. And there was a huge Latino population explosion during the gold rush, which lasted about 10 years. Uh, of course, it was easy to come from Mexico, just um, this was still actually part of Mexico in, eight, in January 24th, 1848. So people walked, tens of thousands of miners and their families just simply walked from Northern Mexico, Sinaloa, Culiacan, Sonora, up to California into the gold fields. But they came from all over Latin America because all over Latin America, people had heard about gold. Here we have an ad for uh, ships sailing from San Francisco to Guaymas in Northern Mexico, to San Juan del Sud in Central America and Valparaiso in South America. And miners came from Chile and Argentina and El Peru and Ecuador and Colombia and Bolivia, and Brazil, and Cuba, and all over sent from Central America. So Latinos from all over came crowd pouring in, and there was a huge population explosion. The Latino population grew 10 times during that decade from 1849 to 1859. But then 10 days later, the end of the Big Bang, suddenly the US takes California from Mexico and installs a different government through the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. So just as all these folks were pouring in from all over Mexico, Central and South America, suddenly California is a foreign country. And the US constitution was very different from the Latin American constitutions in that it permitted slavery. It was based on white supremacy, non-whites could not be citizens and married women had no rights. Well, this political change was upsetting to Latinos in California. And so they said, well, 
we don't like this, so we need to get involved. So Latinos went to the California Constitutional Convention in 1849, and they took a stand, and they helped to write the Constitución del Estado de California. Oh, they wrote a version in English, too, the California State Constitution, because the Constitution very clearly said, all laws, decrees, regulations, and provisions, which from their nature require publication, shall be published in English in Spanish. Spanish is not a foreign language in California. In fact, in many states, it is not a foreign language. It's in their state constitutions. Secondly, Latinos put their foot down. They said, we got rid of slavery in 1810. We're not allowing it in. And California came in as a free state. And in fact, that upset the balance per the Missouri Compromise between the free and the slave states. That led directly to the American Civil War. Thirdly, citizenship was extended to non-whites. Here is a photograph of Governor Pio de Jesus Pico, the last Mexican governor of California. You look at his photograph, clearly he's Afro-Mexican, indigenous Mexican, probably some Iberian. He was our governor, he was a citizen, and he voted for the next 50 years. And women's rights was also roundly uh, discussed and Latinas came away winning and the Iberian principle of women having right to own property independently of the husband was in the California constitution. And that has worked its way into nearly every other state constitution. So that seven years later, Petra Varela de Rubio, okay, she know, we know she's married, she's a de Rubio, I took out this ad telling people that none of my children has the right nor authority to sell grapes from my vineyard because I alone am the absolute owner of this property. Yo sola soy dueña absoluta de esa propiedad. Now, if she had been in Pennsylvania, she couldn't have taken this ad out. She would have to gone to hubby and say, hubby, please do something about my grapes. No, this was her grapes, her orchard. Well, all of these uh, events, slavery, citizenship, color, women's rights, etc., led eventually to the American Civil War. And I am going to pull up a video just to give us all a quick brief about Latinos and the American Civil War. Sit back, you're gonna enjoy this. Cinco de Mayo is the most popular Latino celebration in the United States. Every year, millions of people celebrate it in venues ranging from small grammar school dances to large commercial fiestas. Yet, in Mexico, the Cinco de Mayo is not widely celebrated as it is in the U.S. So the question is, why is the Cinco de Mayo so widely celebrated in the U.S. when it is not in Mexico? The answer is that the public celebration of Cinco de Mayo was created by Latinos living in the American West, California, Nevada, and Oregon, during the dark days of the American Civil War. Wait a minute, Latinos in the American Civil War? What is that all about? During the American Civil War, many Spanish language newspapers were published in California. In Los Angeles, El Amigo del Pueblo. And for example, in San Francisco, El Eco del Pacifico. We can read these Spanish language newspapers today and we can hear Latino voices speaking to us from 150 years ago. At times, the voices tell us about Latino daily life, restaurants serving Mexican food, musicians to provide tunes, musical and theatrical performances, births of the next generation, weddings, and deaths. We also hear the voices of Latinos concerned about policy issues that were tearing the United States apart, like slavery and race. When the American Civil War erupted, Latinos supported Abraham Lincoln and the United States against the Confederate slave states who wanted to create a new nation built upon forced labor held in chains. Latinos took up arms against the slave states. Major Jose Ramon Pico organized four troops of Spanish-speaking United States cavalry. But from the very first armed encounter of the Civil War, the slave states rode a streak of luck, winning battle after battle. While the Spanish language newspapers informed Latino readers of defeat after defeat for the United States Army. And then things got worse. 
Taking advantage of Lincoln's preoccupation with the Civil War, Napoleon III, Emperor of the French, sent his troops marching towards Mexico City to overthrow the Constitutional Republic headed by President Benito Juarez and install Maximilian of Austria as the Emperor of Mexico, who would then be free to cooperate with the slave states in the rebellion against the United States. But the French troops were stopped dead at the Battle of Puebla, fought on Cinco de Mayo of 1862, and could not reach Mexico City to create a slave state friend south of the border. In California, Nevada, and Oregon, Latinos read the news of the unexpected victory of Cinco de Mayo and immediately began celebrating this first major victory with the Latino music and dances of the American Civil War. And you will notice they did not use mariachi music for the simple reason that mariachis had not yet been invented. And they did not have dancing adelitas, as those were to be the symbols of the 20th century Mexican Revolution. Every Cinco de Mayo during the Civil War, Latinos in the American West would gather in great crowds to hear speeches. On this great day of Cinco de Mayo, we remember the power of hope, the power of people to overcome great odds. And we remember, we've won in the past, and we will win again. They would march in huge parades. Today, we band together to join our brothers and sisters in the fight. Speakers would remind Latinos that they were struggling against both the slave states and their potential ally, the emperor of the French, Napoleon III. We unite to raise money, people, and any other resources we can spare for Mexico's fight for independence. After the parades and speeches, Latinos gathered in meeting halls and in private houses to renew their energies to stop the slave states and the French in Mexico using the music and steps they were familiar with. We at UCLA invite you to learn more about the American Civil War origins of the Cinco de Mayo in California, Nevada, and Oregon. We invite you to read about the Declaration of Independence in Spanish, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation freeing the slaves in the rebelling states, the shocking assassination of Abraham Lincoln, and the final surrender of the slave states without their slaves. And that is why we celebrate the Cinco de Mayo. So now, if we can go to our breakout room, and I'd like you to just discuss what was the most interesting thing you just learned about Cinco de Mayo and Latinos in American history. Sorry. Are we having fun or what? I was hoping we would get a chance to sort of talk in a large um, group or something. Can I just steal a couple minutes? Anybody just want to pop up and say anything? I think you can just unmute. I'm just I kidding. just wanted to say that what you shared today was so eye-opening, like the numbers. Um, as a Latina, I just think I'm so proud. Like I was telling some of the other ladies, like, I want those slides. Like I want to post them on my social media. I want people to know that Latinos, we, you know, we're making change. We're making movement here and, and we should be proud. So I just really loved what you shared today. Um, the Cinco de Mayo was hilarious. I have a, a best friend. She's from Monterrey, Mexico, and she laughs. She's like, we don't celebrate Cinco de Mayo, you know? Um, so I just loved everything that you shared and interesting about the Civil War. I mean, you know, these are things we don't know. And unless we don't know, you know, we're not going to know them. And you, you taught us a lot here today. And to be able to share that with other people, I'm super proud. So thank you. Thank you for, for bringing that to us. Wow, that's amazing. And for Hispanic Heritage Month, we talk about Latinos in the American Revolution. 
We won America's independence. We financed them, we fought it, and we don't get any thanks for it. That's, Amer that's Hispanic Heritage Month. Let's focus in on Cinco de Mayo. Anybody else just want to pop in and just say how you, you, know, yeah, how you for, feel? Yeah, for me, what struck me most was how embarrassing I feel that uh, so little I know about my own heritage and contributions of Latinos in the United States. So thank you for the enlightenment today. Well, thank you. And this all comes out of my research. Uh, 15 years ago, I didn't know any of what I have just shared with you on the history. I knew all about the medicine and the healthcare. That's what I'm in the school of medicine. That's what I do. And I started from there and I discovered a whole history I didn't know. I was not taught this either. Uh, and so part of our goal is to get this information out. Uh, if you want, I can send you, I wrote a book about this eight years ago in time for the 150th anniversary. Uh, we do presentations. I'm doing about 15 presentations during the week of Cinco de Mayo, uh, including and doing one to the Mexican consulate in Rome. For, they want to teach Italians about Cinco de Mayo. This is relatively new, but it, it's interesting uh, that Latinos are involved in the Civil War and we don't know that history. That says something. We don't have our own narrative of being part of the United States. We're always outsiders. We don't belong. We're foreigners. We're a bad deal for the U.S., but I look at the data, we're the best thing that happened. We've been part of the US, we need to get our voice back. So that's sort of my, my goal out of all of this, let's get our voice back. Can I just take one more comment and then I, I'm gonna close up with uh, looking at the post pandemic recovery. There's, there is something we discussed in, in our group that was the fact that Latino culture had solved things 200 years ago that the US is still struggling with. Absolutely. So the whole idea of changing mm -hmm. things and racism and, and all those things mm -hmm. were sold by Latino culture 200 years ago. And that is something we should put forward. Absolutely. And every single Latin American country, upon achieving independence from Spain, abolished slavery, declared racial equality and citizenship, and property rights for married women. Every single one. I mean, this is a very Americano thing. Very Americano. Wow, this is great. Can I just do one more, just one more pop out comment, then I'll get back to talk about the post pandemic recovery. Anybody else just want to share? Do Dr. Hayes Batista, in our group, we someone brought up the question of how do people in California, Texas, that region of the country feel that they that they could have been part of Mexico if it hadn't been taken away from them at that point? Well, um, actually, people in Florida in uh, the whole Midwest. Remember the Louisiana Purchase was Spanish speaking far longer than it was uh, French speaking. So all those states, you know, Kansas, Oklahoma, uh, all the way up through Minnesota, North Dakota, that was all part of the Spanish empire as recently as 1800. So that two thirds of what's now the United States at one point spoke Spanish. And people forget that. And of course, by 1898, that was all U.S. territory, and you add in Puerto Rico as well. So they acquired us. It's not like we moved in on them, barged in. They acquired us. Uh, you know, my wife's an old Tejana family, and literally the border crossed them. So half the family is born in uh, Eagle Pass. The other half is born in Piedras Negras. And for them, the border was never there. We've always been part of this country. They acquired us, and we've always played, played our role. We've pulled our part. No question about it. Okay, well, let me start to move into the last piece because I want to start talking about the post-pandemic recovery and the role that we see uh, Latinos playing in this. There we go. Last year, uh, last September, when we released our uh, last Latino GDP report, uh, we got some pushback from some reporters who said, well, you guys did okay in the past, but look, you guys are getting hit hard by COVID. You have the worst mortality. Uh, so it's all over. Uh, we're never going to see that again. So we have been tracking very carefully what happens. And, you know, I could talk about COVID-19, by the way, in Latino, so the cow comes home, but that would be another couple of hours at least. Uh, but we see something different. Yes, COVID has really walloped us, 
but we can wallop right back. In fact, we think that Latinos are probably going to wind up leading that post-pandemic recovery. Per, per, whether people do anything or not, and with proper investment, they could really, really, we can really uh, move this country along. So let's take a look at basically how resilient the Latino GDP has been and how resilient Latino society has been. I mean, throw COVID at us, that's nothing. We've had to deal with recessions, wars, civil upheavals. Well, for the longest time, let's just talk about basically my lifetime, 1940 to, to now. Uh, recessions, oh, hey, we've seen a lot of recessions before since the Great Depression. In fact, here we have all the different recessions that the US economy has had since World War II. Uh, you notice the coming of almost one recession every decade. And one indicator up here is Latino male labor force participation has consistently been the highest. Come whatever recession, Latinos remain in the labor force working while other populations drop in participation. And by the way, we've been seeing this quite a bit. A number of people, uh, because of the past year and a half, have left the labor force. And that's why some employers are having difficulty finding workers, but Latinos have done their part. Uh, throw wars at us, and we've had to deal with wars from World War II, the Korean War, Vietnam, the Gulf War, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Throw all of that, and Latinos are still forming households, still most likely to uh, be pulling together their households, starting families, buying houses, and we've been doing that since 70, 1776, by the way, as I alluded to earlier. We talk about that more during Hispanic Heritage Month. We were there at this country's birth. We helped it. Civil upheavals, my God, from the Zoot Suit riots in World War II to the Black Lives Matter of 2020. And here are the different upheavals, particularly in California, from Operation Wetback, uh, Watts riots, English only, Wadner King, Prop 187, Prop 227, Black Lives Matter, COVID-19. And as we look at the establishment of Latino-owned businesses, nothing stops Latino-owned businesses from opening up. So throw recessions at us, throw war at us, throw civil upheavals at us, and we keep moving things along. In fact, we think that Latinos are gonna be refueling America after the COVID pandemic recovery begins. Let me hone in on some very specific data. Here we have uh, a year, slightly over a year's worth of data that covers the uh, first half of the pandemic. Now these are monthly labor force participation rates. This is Latino in the uh, yellow column, non-Latino is the blue line. Now these are monthly. So you notice that the Latino labor force participation rate actually was going up through February whereas the non-Latino was either stagnant or slightly negative. Okay, along came the shutdown in March, and yes, uh, everyone's labor force participation dropped. But after that low point in April, Latino labor force participation bounced right back up. Whereas it hasn't bounced, it's gone up a little bit in the non-Latino since April, but not very much, not like Latino. And we've been tracking this very closely. I didn't have, we have now these data up through December and let the Latino labor force participation rate has been actually growing through all that period. Whereas in non-Latino, eh, it's not growing very much. Another indicator we have been looking at are remittances, uh, remesas to Mexico. So here we have some uh, Banco Nacional de Mexico data uh, from 1995 to 2020. Well, it took until about 19, uh, about 97 to, for that to achieve $1 billion total. Uh, this is per month, by the way, these are monthly. Uh, it took till about 20, 2008 to hit $2 billion a month. It took until about 2017 to hit 3 billion. Here's 2018, 2019, and suddenly if you notice, suddenly they go up to 4 billion. In fact, that was when the pandemic hit and everything shut down, remittances spiked from uh, nearly two and a half billion per month to 4 billion, dropped a little bit in April, then climbed right back up in May and have been consistent. 
The reason why we use this as an indicator, we know that Latino households have been hit the hardest by COVID, that Latino households tend to be in the more precarious uh, industries and occupations, more likely to be laid off, less likely to get benefits. If you remember, Latino households were left out of the first CARES package completely, they plano if there was one non-citizen member. So this pandemic has not been kind to Latinos, issues of rent, food, all the stuff. Uh, and yet uh, many people were predicting that uh, remittances to Mexico and Central America would drop to zero and it was gonna cause chaos in Mexico and Central America. There'd be a hunger, famine, you name it, and it didn't happen. Instead, the remittances have gone to their highest consistent level and stayed at over three and a half billion per month. Now I have to switch data here because I couldn't get any more recent data out of uh, Banco Nacional de Mexico. So I moved over to Banco Bilbao Vizcaya. And here they're looking at remesas to Mexico by percent growth. And so here we have uh, January, February, March. Now this is compared to the year ago, uh, a 35% growth. Yes, that plunge in April, and then they picked right back up. And in fact, have been growing at double digits ever since September of last year, all the way up through January. So there's a resilience there. There's a resilience, despite of being walloped with everything that basically an economy and society could dish out to a population, we're still there and we're still pushing. Because a lot of Latinos have seen optimism, even in the middle of the pandemic. And I think this is part of what drives a lot of the uh, business growth. Uh, Latinos tend to be very, very optimistic. This is a state level uh, poll that was done just last December. But when uh, a sample was asked, when children today in California grow up, do you think they will be better off or worse off financially than their parents? Latinos are twice as likely as whites to say better off. In fact, Latinos are more likely than any other group to be optimistic about the future. And this is classic. We've seen this year after year after year. What happens is Latinos remain optimistic. Everybody else, particularly non-Hispanic whites, get more and more pessimistic, but Latinos are still out there saying, hey, we have great opportunities. And here is just a, a good illustration, Jewel Hurtado, mother, student, Latina, and a council member in Fresno. <clears throat> and just to put something else to rest, because people think that immigration is Latinos' number one issue, and it's not, by the way. Talk to Latinos. Number one issue is education, followed by economics, good jobs, followed by public safety. Uh, we get immigration forced upon us as an issue. And in fact, as you look at the five-year age structure, the vast majority, uh, close to 70% of Latinos, are actually U.S. citizens. In fact, in the younger age groups, 0 to 17, 97% of uh, Latino children, 0 to 17, are U.S. citizens. Young adults, 18 to 34, are 82% citizen. The immigrants are more apparent in the middle-aged, working-age adults, 35 to 49, and the older. And of course, after 65, and this is generational, it goes back up to 78% um, citizen. Uh, we have always been a majority citizen, usually US born population. And yet somehow everyone thinks that we're always and uh, permanently immigrants. And even in the trough of the recession, as I've been tracking Latino owned businesses, uh, Latino owned businesses have been finding their niche, have been uh, finding ways of uh, moving ahead, pivoting, shifting their product line. And, and I think that's part of that optimism that we pick up in poll after poll after poll. So I look at the very robust labor force participation. I look at the fact that Mr. Mesas, except for that one month drop in April, have been at their highest point level ever. And I think that Latinos are gonna drive the post-pandemic recovery in the United States. So with that, I believe we have time for one last breakout room, or do we not? We, We've got three minutes, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, Listen, no, we don't do it. We're gonna it. hand it over to Gris now for the ending remarks. Thank you so okay. much. All right, thank um, you. Doctor, yes, Gris. Dr. Hayes Bautista, I don't know about everybody else, but please, I, I feel empowered I feel empowered to go out and amplify and, and help change the narrative uh, for the sake of yes. all of our community. So thank you so much. And I hope that um, we have you back sometime soon. 
we thank Wells Fargo for making this event possible for us. And we hope that we have many more events like this. And thank you, Sarah House. Thank you, uh, Nancy Rosado for, uh, for your words today here as well. I encourage everyone to amplify these statistics, to amplify this narrative so that we can continue to, to change the story, right? Have a great uh, night, everyone. And um, we hope to see you in our future events. Send us your thoughts, send us your comments, any thoughts or comments you have for Dr. Hayes Bautista, we can forward over to him as well. Have a great night, everyone.